Hi, everybody. I'm Danny Horn, and my talk today is called The Mickey Mouse Watch and A History of Things in General. Uh, I want to talk about Mickey Mouse today, and I don't really have to introduce Mickey Mouse to you. He's one of the most popular fictional characters in the world, um, but I'll just start at the beginning. Uh, Mickey Mouse was created by Walt Disney and his animators, and his first film, Steamboat Willie, was released theatrically in November 1928. Uh, in that cartoon, Mickey works on a boat, and he gets in trouble with his boss a lot because he makes music by abusing animals instead of leaving them alone and doing his goddamn job. Uh, in 1929, Mickey learns how to fly an airplane. Um, he also gets bitten by a piano during a recital, and he declares war on cats in a film called The Barnyard Battle, uh, in which he shoots piano keys out of a machine gun at a bunch of cats who are dressed like German soldiers from World War I. Uh, at the end of the cartoon, he wins the war by waiting for the cats to walk by and then smack them on the head with a sledgehammer, uh, which is weird, uh, but it's only been like five months. They don't really know what Mickey Mouse cartoons are supposed to be like yet. Uh, in 1930, Mickey becomes a firefighter, still kind of rough on the animals, um, but he rescues Minnie from a burning building, and so obviously he's trying to be more of a good citizen. Uh, except that two cartoons later, he goes to jail for reasons that they never explain. Uh, this is a cartoon called The Chain Gang, and early Mickey Mouse cartoons really were just built around musical numbers. So in this, the prisoners just start smacking on rocks, and that turns into the anvil chorus, uh, and then stuff kind of goes from there. At the end of the cartoon, Mickey escapes from jail, and he's a fugitive from justice, and they track him down with dogs, um, which is apparently fine because at the end, he's just in his cell, singing with his fellow prisoners. Um, really, in 1930, all Mickey cared about was singing. Everything else, not that big of a deal, I guess. Um, by 1931, Mickey Mouse starts to simmer down a little bit. Uh, they start doing like cute birthday party cartoons, where he sings piano duets with Minnie. Uh, so apparently, his time in prison has helped him to sort of reconsider some of the choices that he was making. Uh, by 1932, Mickey is winning football games and going duck hunting with Pluto. And, like, he doesn't even kill any ducks or turn them into accordions or anything. Like, the ducks win. Um, so by this point, Mickey is, is becoming what we would recognize as, like, a mainstream cartoon character. And then in 1933, the Ingersoll Waterbury Company produced the first Mickey Mouse watch. Um, this watch was incredibly popular and really influential, and so to kind of explain the story, I'm just going to go to the Wikipedia article about the Mickey Mouse watch, which, um, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, well, that makes sense. I mean, it's, you know, it's not very significant or notable. Um, there's probably not even actually that much to say about it. Um, but as long as I'm up here, uh, let, uh, <laughs> let me see what I can do. Get some original research going. The Mickey Mouse watch story really starts in 1929 with the stock market crash. Um, by this point, they'd only done about a dozen Mickey cartoons. Uh, the sequence basically goes like this. 1928, there's Steamboat Willie. 1929, there's the plane and the piano and the war on cats. And then it's October 1928, and it's the stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, and then, like, Mickey then becomes a firefighter and et cetera. Like, he just moves on. Like, he's a mouse. The stock market means nothing to him. Uh, so a month later, in November 1929, a month after the stock market crash, a man from a stationery company approaches Walt Disney in a hotel lobby and says that he wants to put Mickey Mouse's picture on a school tablet. Uh, and Walt was reluctant at first, but the guy offered him $300 in cash on the spot. Uh, so Walt said, okay, and he went and got a piece of paper, and they wrote out a little contract. And so this is the first Mickey Mouse licensed product. And that's the way it works. Like at Disney, they were running an animation studio. They didn't know how to make clothes or toys or anything like that. Um, so other companies would pay for a license so that they could use Mickey Mouse on their products. Now, you would think that the beginning of the Great Depression is not an ideal time to be producing non-notable luxury items like Mickey Mouse merchandise, um, but Mickey Mouse was really just incredibly popular, not just in the US, but in Europe and, and soon across the whole world. So there was this explosion of Mickey Mouse merchandise in the early 1930s, and a lot of it looks weird to us now, because they were simultaneously trying to figure out, A, what the character actually looks like, and then B, how to mass produce that using the materials and the technology that they had at the time. So in 1930, uh, Disney contracted with a company called the George Borgfeldt Company to be their licensing agents. Disney really didn't know how to do this. 
Um, so Borg felt their job was they were going to produce a bunch of merchandise overseas and import it. Uh, and then they were also going to sign licensing deals with other companies. Uh, this arrangement did not really work out for very long. Um, Borgfeld produced toys and pencil boxes and kind of this endless line of little bisque figurines. Um, but the problem with them was that they were really kind of downscale. And uh, the stuff that they produced was not very good quality. And uh, they really only sold to like dime stores like Woolworths. Meanwhile, in 1930, there were some folks in Europe who were also creating Mickey Mouse merchandise, but they hadn't paid for a license. They were just doing it because like, they thought it was a good thing to do and they didn't realize anybody was going to tell them to stop. And since Borkfeldt's uh, merchandise wasn't that high quality, sometimes it's kind of different to tell them apart. Um, so I want to play a, a little game with you, a little audience participation game, called Licensed or Bootleg, where I'm going to show you an item of early 30s Mickey Mouse merchandise, and I'm going to ask you to guess whether that is a licensed product of Disney or whether this is an illegal bootleg. You guys ready? All right, excellent. All right, this is the first one. This is a sparkler toy. When you kind of squeeze the handle, it spins around and it makes sparks. Is this licensed or bootleg? <laughs> All right, I'm hearing bootleg. Uh, yeah, this is, this is bootleg. Uh, it really, so this was made in Spain in 1930. You can tell this bootleg because the guy on the left there is Felix the Cat, who is not a Disney character. Felix the Cat was actually the most popular cartoon character in the world before Mickey came along, so you wouldn't think that they'd like, hang out together. Um, but uh, yeah, but apparently they're getting together in the off hours, and I don't know if you can tell, but what they're doing is they're leaning into the fire to light their cigars, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, here's another one from 1930. This is Mickey and Minnie on a motorcycle trip together. This is a tin toy, licensed or bootleg? Yeah, this is, uh, this is bootleg. You're, all, you're, you're thinking about it too hard. Uh, yeah, so this was made in Germany. In Germany, actually, the, the toys were really weird. They had, like, this kind of rat face, and they really liked the teeth in Germany. Um, Mickey Mouse does, like, the character does have teeth, and you see it sometimes, but they never, like, not when he's at rest. It looks really weird, um, except in Germany. Uh, and also, uh, these guys have five fingers, and they're not supposed to, so that's not a thing. All right. This is one, this is a place card holder. Licensed or bootleg? This one is licensed, yeah. Um, so as you can see, it really was not a perfect system. Um, this was made in Japan. This is a Borgfeldt thing they made in Japan and, and imported it. Uh, this is made out of celluloid. Uh, Borgfeldt made a lot of like toys and stuff out of celluloid. You don't see them around a lot anymore because celluloid is really fragile and super flammable. So there were kind of like these little pocket infernos throughout the 1930s, and now we, we don't use that anymore. Uh, all right, here's another one. This is a wind-up tin toy, 1930, licensed or bootleg. Here, mostly bootleg. This is bootleg. Yeah, this is Germany. Again, uh, the teeth and the rat face is how you can tell. Um, now how about this? This is tricky. 1932, this is a piggy bank where you press Mickey's ear down, and his tongue pops out. And then you put, you know, that's where you put your coins, and then that's the bank. Is this licensed or bootleg? All right, I got most of you. This is licensed. By 1932, they kind of caught up with everybody in Germany and Spain who was doing this. So this is licensed. It is supposed to look like that. Um, and then there's this one, um, which this is not actually part of the game. I'll give you that. This is, this is licensed. Uh, it's 1935, it's made by Fisher Price. I, uh, I just wanted to show this to you just to prove that time is real and that 1935 is different from now. <laughs> um, so that's, I'm, I'm going to be coming back to that idea a little bit later on, so just keep that in your head. Time is real. Uh, all right, this is the last one, last item in the game. 1930, the first Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse doll. What do you say? License or bootleg? You are so not sure. You see how hard it is. Uh, this is licensed too. Well done. Um, yeah, this was made in London by a company called the Dean Rag Book Company, uh, and they're horrible. Um, <laughs> and actually, like Walt really hated these, and this was really the thing that kind of led to the final end with Borgfeld. Um, 
because, you know, Walt was in California in Hollywood, and Borgfeldt was in New York, and then the doll manufacturers were in London. So Walt would see a sample, and he would say, this is terrible, and he'd write a letter and say, this is terrible. And then that would get sent by train to New York, and then Borgfeldt would put it on a steamship and go to London. And in London, they get it, they write a reply, come back on steamship, and then it has to go from New York to California, and Disney would get the reply, and he'd open it up, and it would say, so what do you not like specifically? And I was just like, oh, like everything just took months and months, and, and it ended up just that, that they like canceled the license with the company, and they canceled stuff with Borgfeldt, and they just moved on with their lives. Um, meanwhile, in 1930, there was a woman named Charlotte Clark uh, who was in L.A., and she was making uh, these really cute Mickey and Minnie dolls. Like, I know these look weird, too, um, but like compared to the evil ones, like these look really cute. Uh, and she was just making them for, like, for herself and her friends and family, and, uh, and they're adorable. And Walt loved them when he saw them. And so he actually hired her and set her up in a little house that was next to the studio called the Doll House, uh, where she and six other seamstresses would just sit and make these handmade Mickey and Minnie dolls and then ship them all over the country. Um, but they could only make about 400 a week. And so in 1931, they printed a pattern in McCall's, a sewing pattern, so that people could make their own Mickey and Minnie dolls, which is adorable. Um, at this time, like in, by 1931, Walt still wasn't really thinking about the merchandise as like a revenue generator. He was thinking of them more as just promotion for the cartoons, which is the thing that he really cared about. Um, so if a kid had a Mickey Mouse doll in their house, then like that was an advertisement for the cartoon. And it didn't really matter like whether they bought it or, or if somebody had actually made it themselves. And then, and then in 1932, a salesman named Kay Kamen went to the theater, uh, watched the Mickey Mouse cartoon, and, and was really impressed with uh, the, the potential value of, that Mickey Mouse would have in terms of revenue if he actually had like a proper merchandising and marketing team. So he went to Walt with kind of a head full of ideas. He got hired immediately. Um, one thing that Kamen was really good at was finding the right company to, you know, to license this particular item and then really work with that company to make sure that the quality of it was, was as good as it could be because he knew that if they kept making bad-looking stuff the way that Borkfeldt did, then people would just lose interest in Mickey Mouse. Um, and so one thing he did was to put out this yearly catalog of Mickey Mouse merchandise. We'd send to store owners where all of the merchandise looks really exciting and dynamic, and it would encourage uh, the store owners to, like, to buy the whole line. And they made a ton of things. They made everything, basically. Uh, furniture and purses and jewelry and cookie cutters and glasses and tea sets. Uh, they made Mickey Mouse batteries to use in your Mickey Mouse flashlight. Uh, they made Mickey Mouse cameras and Mickey Mouse underwear. And they also made these kind of eerie masks, which um, are being used in this photo for reasons that I do not understand. Um, and then in 1933, Kay Kamen came up with this idea of a Mickey Mouse wristwatch. And Walt actually was not supportive of it. He didn't think that it would ever sell. There'd never been a cartoon character on a wristwatch, and he didn't think that anybody would want to wear one. Um, but Kamen kind of saw the potential here, and so he approached the Ingersoll Waterbury Company. Now, 1933 was actually the height of unemployment in the U.S. because of the Great Depression. Uh, unemployment was at 25%, and the Ingersoll Company was actually kind of sort of on the verge of going bankrupt. Um, they couldn't pay their debts, and, and they were kind of running out of money, and then Kay Kamen came into their lives. Uh, the watch debuted in May 1933 at the Chicago World's Fair, and Kamen set them up with a pavilion that had a little mini factory in it. So you could go and buy a, a Mickey Mouse watch and then actually see them make it while you're standing there. Um, and it sold like crazy. Everybody really liked it. It outsold the official commemorative World's Fair watch by like three to one. And when they started selling it at Macy's department store in New York, they sold 11,000 watches in one day. Um, they sold a million watches within eight months. Uh, the Ingersoll employees went from 200 to 3,000. And it just, it saved the company. It was one of those rare Great Depression success stories that didn't happen except for this. Um, and then, although it did happen again in 1934 for the Lionel Train Company. Uh, they made like toy tin trains. And... In May 1934, Lionel was in receivership. They couldn't pay their debts. And then in July, uh, they got the license to make these hand cars. Uh, they sold these for a dollar, which was $18 in our money. 
Uh, and they sold 250,000 of them within four months. And it saved the company. By December, they paid off all their debts and they had cash on hand. So Mickey Mouse saves companies. And so that's why in Thanksgiving 1934, the citizens of New York rose up and fashioned this enormous Mickey Mouse totem and led him through the streets, leading the citizens to Macy's department store like the boss that he is because Mickey Mouse is going to make you money. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that Mickey Mouse ended the Great Depression, um, except that he kind of totally did. Uh, so the watch itself, the Mickey Mouse watch, well, there's two really exciting features about it. One is that the hands are animated. That's actually like Mickey's hands that point out the time, which is super cute. And then the second hand is just that little dial at the bottom with three little Mickey mice running in a circle uh, to show that the watch was running and, and it was keeping time. Uh, and Within about a year, other characters started to release their own watches. So Betty Boop and Buck Rogers and Tom Mix, who were all famous back then, uh, all had watches by 1934. Um, but Ingersoll was the only one who really got this animated hands thing. So in 1934, Ingersoll made their second Disney product, which is this alarm clock that's based on Disney's Silly Symphony cartoon, The Three Little Pigs. So it's got the three little pigs and the big bad wolf. And I know it looks German like some of the other stuff, but like this is... You know, this is actually what it's supposed to look like. Um, and his arms are sort of pointing at the time. And then in 1935, a Donald Duck watch with the same gimmick. Uh, so after a while, other characters started to imitate this, including in 1935, there was this Popeye stopwatch. Um, and in 1949, this Porky Pig watch. And then there's this 1935 Little Orphan Annie watch, which has normal hands, but Little Orphan Annie is painted on the back, clearly pointing at five minutes to three for some weird orphan reason of her own. <laughs> so if you have this watch, you're like, oh, what time is it? Oh, oh, it's five minutes to three. Like, if you really like five minutes to three, this is the watch for you. And then in the 70s, like, a lot of companies uh, started making watches with this animated hands thing, so including Bozo the Clown and Howdy Doody, uh, Fred Flintstone, Andy Panda, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, Big Bird, Snoopy, uh, and then obviously a lot of Disney characters as well. So Minnie Mouse, uh, Snow White, Cinderella, uh, Daisy Duck, Jiminy Cricket, Jose Carioca from The Three Caballeros, and Bongo the Wonder Bear from Fun and Fancy Free, as well as Minuteman Mickey, and Sorcerer Mickey, and Disco Mickey. So, so here's the thing about time. Uh, history doesn't just happen on the big important clocks. Time is also passing on the wristwatches on everybody's wrist. And if you pay close attention to something, even if it seems insignificant and not notable, it can illuminate things about the past that would otherwise be difficult to see. It's a way of gaining perspective. And more specifically, it's a way of gaining other people's perspective. So the question is, in 1929, why did the entire country go bananas for Mickey Mouse? Um, part of that answer is, obviously, like, the quality of the cartoons themselves. They were fun and funny and musical and full of life. They were way ahead of what anybody else was doing. Um, but that is not the whole story. For the whole thing, we have to go to the Fox Dome Theater in Ocean Park, California, uh, where theater manager Harry Wooden started the first Mickey Mouse Club. Now, this isn't the 1950s TV show. This was an actual club for kids. Uh, Wooden wanted to attract kids to the theater for, uh, for Saturday matinee. And so he started a club for kids who like Mickey Mouse, and obviously everybody likes Mickey Mouse. Um, so that, yeah, sorry. And so it was like unbelievably popular, and Disney hired Wooden then to, uh, to actually like work for the studio and help these clubs start all over the country as a way to get kids to come in every Saturday matinee and build relationships between the theater and the kids. So this is how that club worked. Um, kids would come Saturday matinee, and uh, they would show a Mickey Mouse cartoon. And then they would introduce the club's nine officers. There was a chief Mickey Mouse, a chief Minnie Mouse, a cheerleader, a song leader, a master of ceremonies, two sergeants at arms for some reason. Like, it was a very complex hierarchy. Um, and after they introduced all the officers, they would sing America. They would sing the Mickey Mouse Club song, and they would shout the Mickey Mouse Club yell. Uh, and then they'd like, go ahead and show a movie. Um, now, I don't suppose anybody here is interested in hearing the Mickey Mouse Club yell at all. Are you? Is that, is that a thing? 
OK, all right. All right, I'll do it. Uh, it went like this. Handy, dandy, sweet as candy, happy as can be. Any, icky, mini, Mickey, M-O-U-S-E. Thank you. The Mickey Mouse Club yell. Thank you so much. Uh, so the idea here is to create these rituals that kids can build their lives around. It's actually a lot like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts with like officers and pledges and they talked a lot about good citizenship, but the core philosophy of this organization is that everybody is obsessed with Disney cartoons. And it worked, it was fantastic. Uh, by 1930, there were 150 clubs like this around the country. By 1932, there were 800 clubs in movie theaters around the US. Um, and it was so successful that the studio started sending out these official bulletins of the Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, this wasn't for kids, like this was for theater owners to encourage them to keep uh, supporting the club. And so I would like to read a little bit to you uh, from this August 1932 issue, the story Begin Fall Membership Drive. By the 1st of September, vacations will be over and everyone's thoughts will be centered on activities at home. Get the kids coming to the theater now and you'll have them all winter. Make a check of the enrollment in public and private schools in your town or neighborhood. Are you getting them all? Because attendance at the weekly Mickey Mouse Club meeting is apparently mandatory. So this is a vision of childhood that is basically like centered primarily around the purchase and consumption of Mickey Mouse merchandise, which honestly, in my opinion, is actually better than a lot of the alternatives. And the thing that really made this work is that it was a collaboration between the movie studio and the theater owners and the department stores. Um, so if you wanted to join the club, you would go to the department store's toy department and pick up an application. And then when, people, when kids went to the, the movies on Saturday, there would be displays of Mickey Mouse merchandise in the lobby. And then they would also give away a couple uh, so that kids would know what was available. And after a while, there started to be like other sponsorships and cross promotions with like bakeries and, and flower shops and, uh, and ice cream parlors. It became kind of this civic organization. So this was basically like a new media synergy play where the new medium is like motion pictures and sound. And uh, so Cayman, he was super obsessed with the promotion and so he uh, found this company in Canton, Ohio called Old King Cole that would make these paper mache figures of Mickey Mouse with a motorized arm that moved up and down. Uh, and so they started offering it to theater owners and to department stores to you know, have as a display, essentially saying like Mickey will draw customers in by like the hypnotic power of the mouse and his moving arm. Um, like just look at this picture, like see how the children will flock to your theater. They will worship your Mickey Mouse icon as a god. It was amazing, and it worked, is the thing. So they made a ton of them, and not just Mickey Mouse, but also uh, Minnie Mouse. And there's uh, Donald Duck and Goofy and Pluto. At the top there, that's the three little pigs and Big Bad Wolf. Up in the corner, that's the funny little bunnies from another Silly Symphony cartoon. And then here at top left, uh, those are two of Mickey Mouse's friends that nobody really remembers anymore, uh, Clarabelle Cow and Horace Horsecollar. So in 1935, like, businesses actually paid cash money for a paper mache animated Clarabelle cow to put in their display window, like, and that was a good idea. Like, that was a thing that actually worked at the time. Uh, the thing that uh, was really, really special every year was the Christmas promotion that came and set up. Uh, this was a huge animal annual <laughs> promotion that turned the store into the official Mickey Mouse headquarters. And the central theme of the promotion was that Santa Claus and Mickey Mouse were best friends and equal partners. And so Kamen wrote this huge book that he would send to store owners to explain the promotion and what they're gonna do. Um, I would like to read a little excerpt from this, from the Christmas promotion book for 1934, which begins by suggesting that you start off the holiday season with Mickey Mouse and Santa Claus flying from the North Pole and landing a plane in the airport in your town and then leading a parade, Santa Claus and Mickey Mouse together, from the airport to the department store. The parade will naturally go directly to the store and a sensational climax will be reached if Mickey and Santa lead the children up to your toy department and there distribute fitting and inexpensive tokens of appreciation. As another sensational idea for a finish, Santa and Mickey could climb up a ladder to the top of the building and disappear down a specially constructed chimney. Which sounds, I, it, it makes you wish that we were in 1934, right? 
And then in the store, which is now the official Mickey Mouse Club headquarters, there are signs and special decorations and banners and buttons and little giveaways and stuff. Um, now, it, it's not like Mickey Mouse was the only toy in 1934. Like, there were tons of popular characters, Shirley Temple and Dick Tracy, uh, Buck Rogers and Popeye. Kate Kamen's idea was to take this and turn it into this. You know, basically saying, like, sure, you could stock other character stuff if you feel like you need to, but uh, Mickey Mouse is in charge of Christmas. And I just want to read, like, another few little excerpts from this uh, 1934 promotion book which suggested a Mickey Mouse post office where Mickey would carry the messages from kids to the North Pole. Uh, they could give out letters on Mickey Mouse stationery signed by Santa Claus and Mickey Mouse, um, or an ice cream booth serving Mickey Mouse ice cream. Like, that's it, that's the whole idea, just give away ice cream. Like, basically anything that you can do, get people into the store and buying Mickey Mouse stuff. Um, now, this is 1934, this is the height of the Great Depression. And when we think about this time period, you know, you think about like unemployed guys standing on a really long line for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. You don't really think about like free ice cream and Santa Claus parades. Um, but these things were actually happening at the same time. And that's kind of like, that's the not notable for you. That's how the not notable rolls. They don't play by your rolls. And so 1934, like you can actually, you can see why this was happening was because Mickey Mouse was fun and people could use some fun in 1934. Uh, and also, he was generating the kind of economic activity that the country needed in order to survive. So, if Mickey Mouse could actually like, bring people into your store with money in their hands, then yeah, we're going all in for Mickey Mouse. And so, the window displays got kind of crazy around the middle of the 30s. Um, like this one here. This is the window display for the Pacific States Savings and Loan. This is a bank. So, like, at this point, Mickey Mouse has basically like taken over the entire economy. And to further illustrate the stranglehold that Mickey Mouse had on the American consciousness, uh, here are some promotional buttons. They didn't wear t-shirts in the 30s, but apparently they wore a lot of buttons. Um, so this is Mickey Mouse uh, sponsoring sneakers and ice cream and soap and radios and brushing your teeth and underwear and more brushing your teeth, uh, back to school needs, whatever Spingle Bell Chick O K might be. Um, and really, seriously, they were kind of overinvested in whether you brush your teeth or not. Uh, and then there's this button. I just, I love this picture so much because the button says safety first, but it looks like it's been through a wood chipper. <laughs> like, what happened to that child? It's terrible. Uh, so, speaking of safety concerns, and to prove once again that time is real, uh, I would like to show you some items from 1930s Mickey Mouse merchandise that would never be sold today. Starting with the Mickey Mouse razor blade. <laughs> we have the picture of Mickey on the package, and then the words Mickey Mouse actually etched into the razor blade itself, which is incredible. Um, there's also this Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse ashtray. Uh, and if I'm going to be honest with you, and there are no secrets between us, there were a lot of ashtrays. They, there are so many Mickey and Minnie ashtrays in the 1930s. Um, and then in 1934, there's this amazing Mickey Mouse topple over shooting game where you have a gun which you point at terrified Mickeys and Minnies who are clearly trying to surrender. In 1936, they made Mickey Mouse pocket knives. Uh, in 1937, they made this nightlight with a filament in the shape of Mickey Mouse that would glow when you turn it on, which means that every child in the world is now interested in touching the light fixtures. And then this is my favorite thing of all time. Uh, the Mickey Mouse Home Foundry LED casting set. where you get these super fun home foundry tools, so you can melt down lead over a fire, pour it into the molds, and then you get these jagged figurines of Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, and Pluto that you can like, keep in your bedroom and you know, tuck in under your pillow at night. So basically, Mickey Mouse is trying to kill your children. That is a fact. Like That is just a thing that you are just gonna have to get used to. All right, back to the watches. Uh, in 1938, for Mickey Mouse's 10th birthday, they added like a redesigned uh, watch with a new kind of full-figure picture. Uh, from 1941 to 1945, they didn't sell any Mickey Mouse watches because there was a war, um, which you may have heard of. It was one of the big ones. 
1946, when everybody got home, America got back to doing what they do best, which is producing and selling Mickey Mouse watches. Um, so this 1946 one is just his head and the gloves, and it looks weird and it didn't sell that well, so they replaced that in 1947 with a more traditional, like, full-figured Mickey Mouse watch. And then in 1948, for Mickey's 20th birthday, they put out this, like, 10-watch set, uh, which is, like, Mickey's birthday collection, which includes some surprising characters. So there's Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Daisy Duck. There's Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket. There's Dopey from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and then Jose Carioca from Two Carrieros, Bongo the Wonder Bear from Fun and Fancy Free, as you know, uh, and then Bambi and Pluto, and uh, they don't have hands. So the, the hands of the clock are actually their ears, which is just completely adorable. Uh, and so, as you can see, like, sort of from 1933 to 1938 to 1947, you can actually see like, that the design of Mickey Mouse is changing. He's getting progressively cuter. Um, and actually, in 1979, biologist Stephen Jay Gould uh, wrote an article for Natural History called A Biological Homage to Mickey Mouse, where he noticed that Mickey Mouse has been aging backwards. Uh, there's this concept called neoteny, which describes how babies look. Um, so basically, you know, when a kid is born, Babies have like really big eyes and really big heads and sort of a bulging cranium where the brain is uh, and sort of little bodies and kind of short stocky arms and legs. Uh, and we are programmed by natural selection to find those attributes cute and to want to take care of something that looks like that so that adults would take care of their newborns. Uh, and that is so deeply ingrained in our instincts that we find anything with big eyes and big heads and little arms and legs cute, including like bunnies and puppies and kittens and Pokemon characters, like we, that's just a thing that we respond to. And so Gould noticed that over time, Mickey Mouse started to look more and more like a baby, like bigger eyes, bigger head, uh, shorter, stockier arms and legs. Um, it's hard to do the bulging cranium with Mickey Mouse just because his head is a circle and that didn't change. But what they did was, if you can see on the last figure, they kept pushing his ears like farther and farther backwards uh, to kind of create this sloping forehead that we find adorable. So he wanted to measure this because he's a scientist. Um, so he took examples of Mickey Mouse from three time periods and looked at three things. The eye size compared to the head, the head size compared to the body, and then the increased cranial vault, which is measured from the nose to the, the rearward declension of the front ear because this is science. Um, and what he came up with was this incredible chart which shows, uh, this is from the 30s to the late 40s to the 70s, that for the eye size it went from 27% to 42% of his head. His head size went from 42.7% to 48.1%, and the cranial vault size went from 71.7% to 95.6% compared to the back year. And so you can see proof of this in this 1936 cartoon, Mickey's Rival, uh, where Minnie is being courted by this city rat, slick city rat named Mortimer Mouse. And you can tell that he's a bad guy because his head is only 29% of his body compared to Mickey's 45. Uh, and his snout is 80% of his head as opposed to Mickey's 49%. So that means that Mickey Mouse is cute and Mortimer is evil because that's how cuteness works. As we know. Uh, so you can see this transformation happening with Mickey Mouse, like, getting progressively more youthful over time. I mean, like, actually over time, you can actually, like, watch this transformation happening on America's wrist. Um, and that's the thing about time. It's a process. Everything evolves if it lasts long enough. Um, but actually, it's kind of the other way around. Like, things last because they change in order to keep up with the times. Um, and you can see that process happening every time there's a new materials technology problem. Like, they have to figure out how to make Mickey Mouse out of lead or celluloid or tin or fabric. Um, so an example of that is opening day at Disneyland in 1955. Um, shortly before opening, Walt Disney realized that kids were going to expect to see Mickey and Minnie walking around in the park, and they didn't have any costumes. Um, so they borrowed some from the Ice Capades, which is a, an ice skating show that they've been doing for several years. Um, so they borrowed these costumes, and which was okay, except that the Ice Capades costumes had slits in the, in the face so that the skaters could see out and not bump into other skaters, um, which looked fine across an ice rink, but not right up close to your kids, where they looked terrifying. 
Like this, this, this is not how life should be for people. That's not right. Uh, by the next year, they'd replaced them with uh, you know, masks that didn't have the slits in them, which is a, an improvement, but they're still kind of gruesome. Um, I actually, like, I like these costumes just because they're so eerie. Like, every picture I've ever seen of them looks like somebody's last known photograph. Uh, in 1959, they made some new costumes, and so you can see, like, they're doing the big eyes and the big head, um, but they've got, like, weird skinny little arms and legs, or long skinny little arms and legs, uh, and it, the whole thing just doesn't pull together. Um, so they redesigned them again, and so for 1961, they said, okay, if we're doing big heads, let's do big heads. <laughs> like, go big or go home is basically the attitude here. Um, I like these two, obviously, I think they're cute. And like, I mean, they're basically like the, you know, the logical conclusion of cuteness, um, but they didn't really work that well because the arms were fake, it was just fabric, because the person's arms inside are like curled up around the chin area, um, and so they couldn't really interact with kids. And so they had to redesign them again. And so it wasn't until the mid-60s that they actually arrived on a design that we would consider like even vaguely acceptable today. Um, meanwhile, outside the park, Mickey Mouse's popularity was waning. Uh, his last theatrical cartoon was released in 1953, The Simple Things. After that, it was just Donald Duck cartoons and Goofy cartoons, and not even that many of them, uh, because cartoons were now, you know, it's the mid-50s, cartoons were moving to television. Um, and there's a couple things that happened in the 1950s that uh, kind of diminished Mickey Mouse's prestige. Uh, the first one is this, the 1955 Mickey Mouse Club. So this is the, the 50s TV one, not the handy-dandy, sweetest candy Saturday matinee one. Um, Mickey Mouse Club was a daily TV show for kids that was uh, mostly about these telegenic teens called the Mouseketeers. Um, Mickey Mouse did appear, like he was the leader of the club, uh, and, but he just appeared like in the cartoon at the beginning of the show and at the end of the show. Besides that, he wasn't really there. It was mostly just the Mouseketeers. Um, and so he started to be like less interesting. Like he wasn't cool anymore, didn't really do anything. Uh, the other thing that happened was that in 1949, Kay Kamen died in a plane crash. And he was the one who was really like keeping that spirit of quality in the licensing alive. Uh, and so during the 50s, the licensing department kind of lost their way. Uh, and there was sort of uh, the late 50s and the 60s, there was sort of this glut of ugly Mickey Mouse merchandise. Um, so like this one right here, or this drumming Mickey Mouse which is a battery-operated remote control toy with light-up eyes, which you would think would be cool. Uh, and it looks like this. Um, and when the eyes light up, it looks like this. Unbelievable. Um, so, you know, by the 1960s, uh, they had really just lost control of what the character is even supposed to look like. Like, if this is where you are, like, life is not going to get, like, a hell of a lot better for you. Um, so his popularity declined. So in 1958... Ingersoll, this is now for Mickey's 30th birthday, the Ingersoll Mickey Mouse watch was this. It was just gloves and the words Mickey Mouse. And then in 1960, they took the gloves out. It just is a regular watch with the words Mickey Mouse written on it. Like this was the watch that Ingersoll made from 1960 to 1967. Luckily, in 1967, the hippies arrived and saved everything, as you know. Uh, now, hippies were the hipsters of their day. Uh, and what that means is that, you know, they wanted to look like they had just dressed themselves with whatever, you know, they found lying on the floor that day, uh, when actually they had been, like, meticulously constructing this look for weeks. And part of that look was that everybody went to a thrift store and got an old Mickey Mouse watch. Uh, as sort of like this sarcastic swipe at the establishment, like sort of how corny popular culture was. Um, and Disney noticed that. So... Uh, they wanted to target the, the market of the, the kids who got high and then went to Yellow Submarine. So in 1969, they re-released Fantasia, which is a movie from 1940, except that this was the poster they used. Um, they were marketing Fantasia as a psychedelic experience, uh, basically saying, like, Walt Disney Productions is saying, please come to our cartoon movie and drop acid. Uh, and people did because time is real. Uh, and then in 1968, like the, um, the tragedy of hipsters is that eventually your fashion innovation is going to catch on in the mainstream and then you have to start over. You can't use it anymore. 
And so that's what happened with the Mickey Mouse watch. Um, that uh, whatever. Uh, Life magazine for their 40th anniversary uh, did a, uh, a big article on Mickey Mouse collectibles and that showed that like adult collectors were actually buying all this old Mickey Mouse merchandise with a big spread on the watches. And it turned out that like all the hippies who'd gone to thrift stores to buy the old Mickey Mouse watches made their value go up. So it started to become kind of a hot thing and it turned into this new iteration of the Mickey Mouse Club watch fad. So in 1968, for Mickey's 40th birthday, uh, Ingersoll put out a new watch. This is actually the 1947 design, but it's with this new wide strap that was very fashionable in 1968. Uh, and they called this the Mod Mickey Watch. And it was a huge success all over again. Um, there were a bunch of celebrity sightings of, of famous people wearing Mickey Mouse watches like John Lennon and Andy Warhol, Carol Burnett, uh, Tiny Tim, uh, Liberace, Grace Kelly, a whole bunch of people. Uh, the most interesting for our purposes today is Walter Shearer in 1968, who was an astronaut on Apollo 9, uh, who actually wore his Mickey Mouse watch into space. Um, and then the next year, so did uh, Gene, uh, astronaut Gene Cernan, who also wore his Mickey Mouse watch. Now, I really wanted to find a picture for you of an astronaut actually wearing a Mickey Mouse watch in a space capsule, and I didn't, and I'm really sorry about that. But Buzz Aldrin uh, from Apollo 11, second guy to walk on the moon, uh, on the Wikipedia page for Buzz Aldrin, there's this picture of him from 1971. And if you look closely and you flip the image around, Buzz Aldrin is wearing a Mickey Mouse watch. And now for my next trick. Uh, in 1972, uh, they put out a new Mickey Mouse watch that was sort of a more nostalgic look um, for the first time, kind of a retro look. So this is kind of a 30s style mouse. It's, it's not the actual 1930s design, but he's got like the long skinny arms and legs and he's got the little pie cut in his eyes. Uh, this was the start of a nostalgia craze. And it makes sense that folks might be like starting to look back to the Great Depression because in the early 70s there was a recession in the United States. So looking back to the Depression kind of as a touch point. Uh, one of the things that led to the recession was the 1973 oil crisis where a bunch of Arab states wanted to punish the United States for supporting Israel. And so they uh, set up an oil embargo. So in the United States, uh, for about three years, there were like long lines at gas stations and there were ration books and, and you just couldn't get gas. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I found this in a book. This is a 1974 Mickey Mouse oil crisis waste basket, which I, when I found this, I could not believe that this could possibly exist. This shows Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse running out of gas. Mickey has a ration book in his pocket, and he's so frustrated that he's shaking his fist at the Capitol building. Like, what is the market for this? Like, eight-year-olds who are really mad at Congress? I can't figure it out. Like, who, it's, it's just one of those moments where it's just like, how did that possibly, who made that? Who decided to sell that? Like, it can't be real, right? Like, it's, um, you know, it must, I thought it must be like a prototype, or it's a joke, or an art piece, or something. Um, but then I went, to eBay, and I found two of them, and I bought one, and here it is. Here we go. So, so you know how God put dinosaur bones in the earth as a practical joke to confuse people? Like, this is my dinosaur bones. Like, somebody clearly went into the past and planted this specifically to screw with me personally. That is the only explanation for this, the existence of this at all. Um, so this, this is non-notable. This is like the gold standard of non-notable. Um, but it's this little nugget of lost time. And it's proof that history is less predictable than we think it is. And that's the thing about time. History is embedded and embodied in these weird little artifacts, and they tell stories about the past. It's like archaeology, but you can do it on eBay. Um, and the past was different, uh, even in ways that you didn't think it could be different, like whether it's okay to sell a razor blade with the words Mickey Mouse on it. But if something is popular and it lasts long enough, it can't help but pick up these little pieces of history as it rolls by. So the past is full of these weird little surprises that are waiting to be discovered non-notable things done by non-notable people that become notable because you're the one that noticed it. 
history is still happening, uh, and we're all a part of it. We are all notable. All you have to do is look at your wrist. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.